Okay, in this uh, episode here, we're going to look at uh, Alexander the Great and his conquest all the way through Persia, or what we know of Persia today, but at this time, Persia encompassed all of, even up into Anatolian area, and in fact, the reason for his uh, conquest back was because of the Persians and their oppression on uh, the Grecian people and uh, how they had come in and with being unprovoked gotten really taken uh, back and pushed into their primordial lands by the Persians and how that drove him to not stop his conquest once he realized that he had come up with the idea or the conceptual military idea that was successful enough to take him halfway across the Middle East there was no stopping him and indeed he only stopped at India itself and then we're gonna look in depth at the reason that perhaps why he stopped at India because there are strange conjectures nowadays you know there was no reason for him to have stopped so why did he but we'll look into that later into this here we're looking at the starting of this and how he had come from Macedonia and at the time the Greeks in Sparta the famous Spartans and so on and uh, the Athenians were there the Thessalonians that were there and Macedonia was really kind of looked at as being more of a a prosperous nation didn't have any problems really going on with it there were some Thracians that were up above it but really considered more more or less themselves and at this time or preemptive to it they were fighting amongst themselves causing their own problems a little bit uh, social unrest if you will and uh, that that was even what had allowed the Persians to come up and really uh, just smoke right through them because they were unprepared for the concept and uh, this area shows a lot of ancient, ancient lore that goes way back farther than this point. Indeed, generally what I look at is things that are at this point, perhaps earlier in time. But uh, one of my regulars had pointed this out to me, and uh, it's something that I did definitely want to touch on. I want to do a four-part series, and this would probably be the culmination of it uh, leading out to the end, and this is probably going to be a two-parter at the end of this. But I uh, just wanted to show how this leads into this and at the age of just 22 Alexander uh, ruler of a small Greek kingdom named Macedonia that's right here uh, led his army now his father was just about or on the eve of actually coming into and pushing Persia back and was killed like so often happened in Greeks and Roman, Roman governance where there was a lot of backstabbing going on there's a famous cartoon that I tried to mimic one time but it got flagged because it's copyrighted but uh, it keeps showing the the rulers and they'd start to talk and somebody'd stab him in the back then they'd start to talk and somebody'd stab him in the back and it just it just kept going and they put little names in front of everybody and it just it just looks kind of disgusting although instead of it really going along that lines it's kind of spread out over time but still in its in entirety it's rather disgusting anyhow so uh so he's a uh, Macedonian and strangely in the old King Tut song is uh, born in Babylonia raised in Macedonia King Tut and uh, let's take a closer look at this you know because he was at 22 and by the age of 32 he passed away so a lot of people look at this as perhaps being a decade to remember it's one of the decades in all of history to remember when things that happened and of course the Persians running up and making their great empires nothing to sneeze at in any way shape or form and that was indeed one of the decades to look at too and there's a few of them through history so um, he led an invasion that came across the isthmus here and started to fight and uh, started to attack the vast Persian Empire at Granicus he led his way through all the way down to Issus which also has something to do with biblicalness and you see in that picture there that Phoenicia is down there too. Canaan is not really mentioned because the Phoenicians called themselves Canaan and that's where that name comes from. Some of this footage comes from a war game simulator game that's out. But uh, he took the, th the Persian throne from himself eventually going all the way through. Uh, now in 330 BC Alexander continued his march east and he led himself all the way through in a way coming up and going down the uh, Tigris and Euphrates through Babylon across the 
Tigris and up into Susa, which we've been talking about here quite frequently, down in here and then back up to Ectabana and uh, Ectabana. Ekbatana? Hmm. And then onward into Parthia, into Bactria, and so on. And his goal was to find and kill Bessus, a Persian usurper claiming to be the rightful king and to subjugate the uh, Persian Empire. And, when we, you know, there are people that do this so much better and so much in depth. I'm just trying to show you a moment in history here, though, I guess. And there were people that had taken over in all of this area that was from the Aryans that were illegal dynasties coming out of the Persian attack that had gone on here and uh, one of the videos I did back about a year ago and it took almost a year to get flagged had a lot of Discovery Channel stuff uh, moments attached into it and uh, it, it showed how that was the case and how they had run through and tried to reset things to where they were supposed to be but it was a, a little too late and there was too much corruption going on but uh, so he wanted to go and subjugate the eastern provinces and so he head through first through an area known as Aria where the Arians and all this people that all through here were anciently known that Medes were known as Arians and so were the Persians uh, Darius himself calls himself that and uh, Herodotus also makes note that everyone was called Arians until they started breaking apart in their own names and their own subjugated titles. Media, when Media uh, had come to them from Athens, Persia, whenever Persis had come to them also. And so there was a showing of uh, when these places kind of changed their names. But uh, so he headed to there in area, today part of Afghanistan, where the uh, Persian gunner. Uh, governor known as Seta Barzanes had launched a revolt after initially pretending to submit to Al uh, Alexander so this caused a little bit of a problem and indeed whenever he went through his campaigns people that subjugated to him fairly easy he left alone and people that wanted to fight hard he destroyed and uh, to, to make a point in some ways and also to, to scare the hell out of people that were on the way that may have heard you know like Marathon where they ran and told the people he was coming uh, the British are coming the British are coming what do you do and uh, so here's some of that footage though and it shows you a rebellion was crushed and then Seta Barzanes was killed in a single combat by one of the Greek cavalry people and uh, an officer in the Greek cavalry. Nearby Alexander founded the city of Alexandria Ariana, its modern Herat, and won around a, a dozen cities that he formed and eventually founded, almost all of them bearing his name in one way, shape, or another from Alexandria and Egypt all the way through here. And uh, he marched on to Farada. And when we got to Farada, the Macedonian court had long traditions of plots and assassinations where uh, once they came to power, people were trying to take over certain parts. And it was a city-state government thing that really was unified, but you could still smell inklings of things like this going on. And it caused him some problems. People that go into depth into Ale Alexander, some people go extremely deep into each one of these uh, little stories that are bought here. But six years before Alexander's own father, King Philip, had been murdered by his own bodyguard, setting him off so he's now informed that Philotas commander of his companion cavalry had uncovered a plot to assassinate Alexander but kept it a secret and this caused a problem Philotas and his father Parmenion were among the most respected of Alexander's commanders Parmenion ran a large of his crew and had played crucial role in all of his great victories and so they knew they were going to get a land to themselves but when Philotas confessed this under torture, Alexander had him executed and then sent assassins all the way back to Ecta, uh, Ecbatana, where Parmenion was governor to kill him before they even got a chance to hear about his death and had a chance to turn back against Alexander. This was kind of helping him to go and resume, so he resumed pursuit. And en route, he found the city of Alexandria, Aracosia, which is modern Kandahar. This is in southern Afghanistan, 
and then he ran up into the mountains here and if you look he's not headed towards India he set it up into ancient proto-indo-european lands and he finally caught Bessus was portrayed by his own man and then handed over to him Alexander sent him back to Persia for execution as a kingslayer shop now he started to go north and he ran into Sogdians and they rose up against him here and these are ancient proto-europeans and steppe people he had to fight off attacks by local tribes and take several towns by assault they were well known for their assaults too he went through Maraconda and on the banks of the Jartaxes River he founded the city Alexandria Eschante Eschante meaning Alexandria the farthest so named because he had last reached the limit of the Persian Empire and the actual known world at that time the known and cared for world you can tell here that he ran up into and it comes and becomes mountains there's really not much above that anything too much farther north of this becomes icic tundra during the winter at least and not so usable land so there's only a good space that's left up here for him to take and he hadn't really run above the Black Sea here and above Thracia in any way and all of these were an ancient Scythian people that we've talked about quite a bit frequently and they're your proto-indo-europeans also so all of these are cousins in some way fighting each other now this frontier was frequently raided by nomads and they're known to the greeks as the scythians and you see them up here and they would come down and do raids now alexander lured them into a decisive battle near the jartaxes river and here they ran into each other the result was a crushing victory for the macedonian king that put an end to the raids and just kind of stopped the situation but some people say although it's not recorded and of course not by the other side that what actually had come was a truce that at the end of this he had sent back people along with him with the people that had survived the few and told them not to uh, fight against him and gave them a stern warning and said that he wasn't going farther into that land but a lot of conjecture to that people that go deep into this entire thing here uh, can get quite lost but uh, fighting against bacterian and Sogdian tribes continued in revolts trying him down in a difficult guerrilla warfare style right but now many of the Macedonian troops were unhappy with Alexander by now many of the Macedonian troops were unhappy they had been stretched pretty far most had not seen their homes in years, some up to eight years, but their king seemed bent on conquest without end. That was worse, uh, or what was worse, is that he'd begun to adopt the rituals and dress of the Persians, some of their customs, and uh, they, they were kind of viewed as effeminate and somewhat decadent. At Mariconda, modern Smarkland, after a furious drunken argument, Alexander killed Cletus. Here. Some accounts say by his own hand. Cletus had been one of Alexander's best generals and the man who had saved his life at the battle that they had at Granicus whenever a man was coming in. in in process of rearing back to swing it's recorded rearing back to swing and had advantage upon him that he reared out and swinging his sword chopped his arm off loosing his sword and his arm in other words taking it off in one blow and this had saved him although the picture here is not of Eusephus Alexander was full of remorse, but his growing arrogance was alienating more and more old comrades. Apparently, he was stretching things a little too far for some people. When he tried to make his countrymen perform the traditional Persian uh, rituals of prostrating themselves before the king, or doing a bowing down before a king in a Persian ritual, he had crossed the line, especially these Greeks, where uh, we're, we're making them Greeks. We're not turning us into Persians, are we? It's kind of a view that's looked. 
Uh, to the Greeks, this was kind of blasphemy. Only a god was worthy of such respect in, in, in people having to do this type of thing. And Alexander wasn't deified as a god at this point, although they did recant later and pretty much put him into that position. But he's first known as a, as a man, really. He's um, forced to back down from that concept there. And everybody says, hey, you're kind of having delusions of grandeur here. Or you're kind of going off in left field. And he goes, well, I am the king of Persia. And they said, no, this is Greece. And he goes, no, that's Greece. This is Persia. I'm the king of the world. I have become the king of kings. But, yeah, things can get to their heads somewhat. And you can imagine somebody controlling the whole world like this in a warlike fashion, how that could give you an idea that he's invincible that no one can touch him and uh, so he's forced to back down though he had common sense uh, this man was was raised by the greats of Greek society so he knew what the hell he was doing so back in bacteria another plot to Alexander Alexander was uncovered and uh, this time the ringleader was a royal page one of the sons of a Macedonian nobility who attended the king himself his name was Hermolaus son of Paul Sopolis. and uh, he'd become murderous and bitter towards Alexander he and his accomplices were caught tortured and then stoned to death and uh, so this tries to call anybody doing this type of thing whenever he has tried to get an empire going on you can imagine that as he grew his empire more and more people wanted to go for his throat so this is known as the pages plot though but Calisthenes, Alexander's official historian, was also implicated in the, in the conspiracy itself. So this is a, a, a bad thing in itself, too. He was thrown in prison where he later died. Anyhow, so now we come on to our important point. In summer of 327, according to a legend, Alexander became captivated by the beauty of Roxana, daughter of a bacterian lord. Roxana. Their marriage was also a sound political move, helping to end local revolts against his rule and allowing him to continue his advance into modern Pakistan and India, which he started to do here. And uh, what he was really trying to do at this point was capture the known world, and they knew the ancient Sumerians all had uh, contact with Maluha, which was India, but it all was based on the ancient Indus Valley River and that he was going to try to reach that other people said it was the river that was deeper into India like the Ganges and so on but I believe that what he was really trying to capture was all of the purple area you see on your map right there and uh, that's really not even quite bordering all but runs into the Indus Valley situation it's really Pakistan is seen today and not India northern India at this time was still kind of Aryan influenced quite some bit but we're not going to really get into that so much now, but this is to the edge of the known world. His rule is allowing him to continue his advance into modern Pakistan and then down into India. Alexander now prepared to subdue the Persian Empire's most eastern provinces and which had yet to recognize his kingship and at this point are that he had taken over and that he was going to take over. You can see by his trail here and no one thought he was going there. He ran extremely far up here to the north. But then as he come back down through his trail, ensuring his path, he captured the rest that he needed to, to end up winning the game of risk, if you will, if you've ever played that game. To do so, he'd first have to cross the Hindu Kush Mountains and reach that Indus River, though. His Hindu Kush Mountains are quite famous, and this is where the concept of Kush comes from, from the Bible, and how the Kushites ended up becoming some of the people that were up above Egypt, it still looked as some type of confusion and then later recanted to being black people that show up much later and the um, Nubians that were under their stead that helped them in the late 25th dynasty but that's a whole nother story in itself so Hindush and Hindu Kush mountains are quite a thing to cross there's only a couple of passes that are led up through there and whenever we come into this area here advancing in two columns is on army won a series of skirmishes against the Aspasil and the Asini and these are proto-Indo-Europeans also and not really India itself 
They fought in their way to what's now the Swat Valley of northern Pakistan and down to the Orch, pardon me, of the Indus River Valley situation and the river. After a fierce siege, Alexander took the ascension capital of Masaga. And this also had something to do with the Masagetes that are said to have been way up over here at one time. But that's another story about Proto-Indo-Europeans. According to legend, it was ruled by a beautiful queen, Cleophus, who bore Alexander a son. And that's probably another separate story, too. Unless we want this to just carry on for hours. But um, this allowed, it to, allowed her to keep her throne. And indeed, in a lot of these places, if there wasn't too much problem with the people, whenever they came through, they allowed them to keep their throne, much like Caesar and a few others had done, where they took it over. And you're going to put my statue up and stuff, and I'm going to get taxes off you, but you can kind of do your thing. Which was a whole lot better than what it was before, whenever they would transpose people here and there and just ruin everything and pretty much try to ruin their heritage. Instead, it looked like a whole lot better way of doing things, although to a more modern people looking at it in this age, it didn't seem to be too much less barbaric. Anyhow, the rule of Texmir and near-modern Islamabad had formed an alliance with Alexander. Together they marched to face Porus, king of Pavaros, the battle of the Hydaspes. And this is important. Here we run into India. It was Alexander's costliest battle as Porus's war elephants inflicted terrible casualties onto him. And uh, war elephants were really quite the thing in a few different armies. And uh, we can go back to the Punic Wars and so on. But, uh, yeah, devastating armies against the Greeks here. But this in this time really um, is something that uh, it, it was like tanks. It was like tauntauns. It's uh, kind of an inspiration for, like, the giant tauntaun battles and, like, what you see in the battle for Middle Earth. And in fact, indeed, Mediterranean mean terrain is earth, it's land, not water. And when we say Mediterranean, perhaps we're talking about the battle for Middle Earth and how things played out. And uh, that's another lead into a, a eventual thing that I'll do on uh, Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings and how that plays into this whole little concept here. And why these rings, certain rings were left alone because those rings were part of the uh, heritage that allowed it to one ring to rule them all wasn't necessarily to rule them all they, they were allowed to do their own thing but within the boundaries that were already placed by themselves so it uh, it worked out quite well despite Porus's fearless leadership though the battle ended in a decisive victory for Alexander and uh, Porus had lost a lot in the battle and it was not a, uh, a loss, as a lot of people try to claim. This one in control of the Punjab area that's there. And uh, from there he starts to go on. I think at this point here, though, um, Alexander wanted to push on into India and reach the Great River, which the ancient Greeks um, had talked about. And as being the, uh, formed the edge of the world, and it wasn't too far from here and uh, leading down a little bit and whenever they reached the next river uh, at the Bias, uh, which was not supposedly the Hyaphasis River, um, his army kind of mutinied because they thought they had reached it after all of this. Come on, haven't we reached your... You can tell after people being in battle for some eight years and have gone through so, so many conquests, pretty much all the greats in his, that are still existent in his armies were supposed to have helped take over provinces and help run it all up under him and they were expected to do this years ago it seems and some of those no longer existed and people probably started seeing the fact that if we continue to do this I may not make it and you may not make it and who ends up making it and hey uh, aren't we about done uh, all we got to do is catch this other little part here and that little part here wasn't really all of India as to say it wasn't really considered to be again under that same uh, I guess you'd say nomenclature as of being the end of the world uh, the pillar of the world India lived off the edge of the pillar of the world I guess if you will 
Um, so let me see here if I can pull this up so I can read this off directly to you as I do. The Macedonian withdrawal from the Indian subcontinent in 326 BC was due to geographical strategy, not a defeat. In fact, he had won the strategical fight here. Now they knew coming ahead in front of them there were going to be large battles and they heard all these people had elephants and all this stuff and it looked like it was a bad thing. But again, they're pretty much done, you know, as to say, if you will. Um, after the Macedonian victory at the Battle of the Hyaspetes River, the Macedonian citizen soldiers um, in Alexander's uh, multi-ethnic polyglot Eurasian army from all these people around that he had adopted into him who constituted only a fraction of his number but were its iron core and driving force or portion foreseeing another long and arduous campaign in Alexander's determination to subjugate the Indian subcontinent the geographical limits of which they understood were beyond their measure and uh, eventually they fully mutinied uh, this was not due to the uh, cowardice of their being inferior to the Indians in strength or of arms, as their unending success to test to to this point they had taken the known world, um, but resulted on account of their having fought for eight years nonstop under the great Alexander's leadership after having defeated King Darius in 330 BC, which was the original objective of the war they set out to fight against the Persians and uh, retake over the area and and really he had actually gone over and above that situation at this point and people had thought it had gone a little bit too far but the Macedonians were simply war weary by this time battle scarred homesick veterans who wanted nothing more than to return to their ancestral continental homeland and conquering heroes now the Persian Empire and beyond and to enjoy their spoils of war and uh, to be heralded as heroes and uh, not to continue to the point that there aren't any heroes left. To counter the Indian war elephants during the battle, Alexander uh, ordered that the shield bearers, or the high space oi, as they call them, his elite infantry corp of hoplites, which is the giant shield bearer, who would fight individually as well as in line, were to replace their straight swords with copoides and macrane. These are similar to Nepalese kukuri and they're instructed to use them and slash the trunks of the animals so these people were coming in and hitting the forelocks like attacking Achilles heel if you would of the uh, elephants and hindering him and really pretty much making him unable to uh, be able to even help in the battle it uh, worked incredible and to stab at their tender feet with their spears with the light armed javelineers archers and they used these extremely long pole arms that they had at the time. Spears, but far too long. Not something that you'd really launch and throw as much as you would use to defend. And something that was fantastic that you could plant the butt in into the ground. And when charging cavalry came, if you could aim it into a body, you would literally pick a man straight off a horse and impale himself onto this thing with, with his own force. And so it's... Uh, some uh, quite a new thing these phalanx warriors uh, really stood out with all this idea um, they also um, would tell that they uh, would you know slash the trunks of the of the uh, uh, elephants and they had found some of the elephants weaknesses and they started to exploit those in quite a bit of way uh, light armored javelineers archers and pelas supporting them commanded to kill the drivers of the elephants and just aim directly towards the drivers and now it became an unknowing force and also to fire their missile weapons at the rumps causing them to stampede uh, hurting the the horse right in his butt uh, they're not the horse I'm sorry the elephants uh, the foot companions were equipped with small heavy metal covered shields the Aspedia and this could thus handle the weapon and were expertly trained to use would take up the two-handed Macedonian pike and held underarm and fight against them exclusively in the phalanx a defensively packed formation of heavy pikemen who advanced halted charging the elephantry by presenting a cohesive flat front and a long iron projectile points atop multiple staggered big staffs at slightly different angles be like come at this and of course they could plant that into the ground and anything coming at them hard was going to literally just impale themselves 
Now, the death of Alexander's beloved war horse, Bucephalus, that happened in some time in June 326 B.C., and at that time he would have been 11 years old, and uh, this is one of the, the horses. They really heralded and loved horses at this time, and uh, it's something that helped mankind quite a bit. Mankind loves the animals that help it out. Um, Bucephalus was a white-faced black well past its prime a pinto from thessaly purchased for 13 talents of silver which is about 741 pounds of silver which was a blow to the morale of the macedonians whenever he died it resulted as much from an old age as it did from wounds suffered in many encounters it even being permitted to fight may have been due to its owner wishing him to die gloriously in the battlefield instead of aged and uh, infirmed in a stall and uh, wasn't going to have him necessarily be a sire for others uh, five years early, you know, to, to die in battle, to die with that grace that we talk about, uh, uh, like you would see in um, Valhalla and so on. Five years early at the Battle of Gogamela, Gogamel, um, where over 1,000 Macedonian mounts or horses perished in the engagement, Alexander would order his grooms or his horsemen to take Bucephalus to the rear, no doubt to spare its life. The favorite among his uh, string of many chargers, its resting place was the foundation city of Alexandria Bucephala, in the west bank of the Hydaspides, with Alexandria Nikea being situated on the east side of it, across the uh, river there. The former was the namesake of both the horse and its masters to commemorate its life the latter being the king and the Macedonian victory over the Indians, and Nike, it does symbolize victory. Macedonian soldiers were always in short supply, stretched thin as they were between south, uh, southeastern Europe and the Indian subcontinent, all the way across. You can imagine how they are stretched out now to their limits. <coughs> Reinforcements could only be obtained from the conscript of the subjected people, the levying of allies with the hiring of mercenaries, pools of recruitment which were considered inferior to homegrown Macedonians and Greek fighters themselves, who were well disciplined, highly trained, and skilled in the application of Greco-Macedonian military sciences, and these other people were not, so they would have just been extras and so on. So it started to become a ragtag fugitive fleet, if you will. <clears throat> in some aspects, where the mounted horde of Genghis Khan appeared in the east over 1,400 years later was made up of some 800,000 Mongol tribesmen raised from its much larger homeland in Central Asia, the Macedonian standing army during Alexander's reign numbered under 60,000 professionally trained native citizen soldiers. And while the former's um, empire was about four times larger the latter's was conquered using significantly less soldiers in proportion to its size, the majority of just, uh, which were uh, really infantry men. And uh, in the part one of this, it actually breaks down to what his army starts out as, but also later it recants a few times where it is. And I'll try to leave the link for this where I got these pictures from here out of this. Uh, he actually just used some pictures and uh, along with some uh, war game footage and it worked out great for him he goes into depth of it much more than i would probably uh in in just doing you know generally i'm trying to show you things that hey well you know all about alexander but you don't know this you know that's more of my aspect of things that i try to show you you know um uh, although a lot of times uh, most people don't even understand the campaign of alexander itself so quite some some difference is seen and, of course, different people speaking about it from different aspects will have different viewpoints. Because of the coalition that he raised, a 